Hello, I'm Harry Sewell and welcome to the Seasoning the Reasoning podcast. Reasoning is a term used in Jamaica when people share a conversation and deeply explore a matter of mutual interest. In this series of podcasts, we hope to season the reasoning with curiosity, intellect, and in some cases, humor. Enjoy. Uh, welcome uh, in our conversation today on the Season of the Reasoning podcast. We've got Rob Berkeley um, and uh, yeah, Rob's an award-winning uh, busybody recovering academic and uh, civic tech geek and community policy nerd. Um, Dr. Rob Barkley is a founding editor of Blackout UK, a digital community anchor, social network and cultural production agency for and by black, bi, gay and or trans men. Um, there's a lot more we could say, um, but <laughs> welcome. Um, great, you know, we've met in a number of contexts and it's kind of great to have you on the Seasons Reading podcast. Yeah, I kind of just want to have a conversation really about um, black masculinity um, and just kind of start with um, this point really that over the years there have been many debates about what it means to be a man um, and just kind of wondered where you were in this debate. It's, a, it's, a, it's one of those questions that, that bounces around uh, and I try not to answer it. Um, because I don't, I don't know, and, and actually I quite like that not knowing. Um, so uh, there's a suggestion somehow that, that, that there are some fixed things about uh, manliness, masculinity, um, and I'm I'm a sociologist by training, so uh, I I think those things are fluid and, and will shift and change uh, in response to the to the world around them. Uh, so what it means to be a man now and what it might mean to be a man in two weeks time could, could be very different things. Mm. Mm. And is there a need for clarity about kind of masculinity as opposed to femininity, um, the kind of clear gender roles? Because I know, um, you know, there are theories um, in sociology and ideas about productivity being dependent upon, you know, having role clarity, which might include role clarity based on gender lines. I mean, I know you kind of avoid the specific question, but what does that mean? I, I think that, that there's um, that there's mileage and, and benefit in understanding the ways in which masculinity is performed, uh, the ways in which it operates in society, um, because of other commitments that we have to uh, to justice, uh, to uh, to not uh, kind of stabilizing uh, injustice in the form of patriarchy. So, um, for the sake of uh, of, a, of a future in which we can uh, all live up to our potential, we should understand the, the structures that we're in, um, and one of those. Uh, is the way in which masculinity is operating in a society at the moment. So I was being slightly glib to suggest I don't, uh, I don't know. Um, I have a sense of the ways in which it's understood, but I try not to, uh, to uh, reify it uh, by um, saying I'm a man and, and, and defining my masculinity by certain sets of uh, behaviors that are defined externally from okay great and i suppose aligned to that um is the kind of feminist critique of patriarchy as you kind of mentioned and then um going back to that critique of you know gender identities you know for some i mean that's a central point not for all but but you know something might be a central point about kind of critiquing it. and i know in jj bowler's book um mask off he describes um the fact that you know feminism provides an opportunity for men who are kind of trapped in you know very narrow definitions of what it means to be a man uh and feminism kind of you know opens up the possibilities and you know in my work kind of linked to mental health i know some of those restrictions people put on themselves or others put on them kind of leads to all kinds of problems including as you probably know that 75 percent 
of um, suicides in this country are by men. So it kind of, you know, has massive consequences. I mean, where do you stand in terms of, you know, your kind of thoughts about the role of feminism in being an asset to us as men? I think, um, I think feminism opens up, open up possibility, but it also closes them down. So um, while, uh, while, while feminism, as a as a lens uh, through which to to understand the world um, is disruptive is is uh, it's something which would enable um, men and women to free themselves from these um, imagined structures um, that that are no use for them. Um, it also uh, it also in attempting to to us beyond essentialist kind of notions of, of, of identity uh, can quite easily trap us in them as well. So um, there, 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 there are ways in which um, uh, men are asked uh, to, uh, to to give up uh, some of the uh, some of the some of the control. Uh, because of the power and because of the because of the unequal power structures in society, and that's that's absolutely the way it should be. Um, but uh, having given up uh, some control over uh, over identity, um, there doesn't seem to be a limit to when um, when when men's agency comes back into into play. Um, so it, it becomes. Uh, a real, a real, a real challenge to do uh, work with with men uh, addressing social justice or, or addressing uh, their aspiration if they can be uh, if they can be told that whatever they do uh, they will never be able to uh, to get beyond uh, the, the notions of masculinity that are imposed from from, from outside and. Um, and I think I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be careful with my words because uh, I don't want to, uh, uh, to 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 bolster the kind of notion that uh, that, that you know the, 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 the feminism is 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 destructive to uh, to men. I think that's true, uh, but it does um, it it does limit. Uh, the space in which uh, they can be creative about uh, about uh, existing uh, patriarchy, um, and I, I feel this quite keenly as a as a as a black man uh, who, um, to some uh, notably first wave uh, feminist, uh, I uh, would be seen to be privileged by the patriarchy. Um, and want to uphold the patriarchy, even though uh, that same system uh, excludes black men. Um, so, so there's a there's a there's a real tension uh, in, in addressing uh, gender and race. Uh, there, there's a there's a real a real struggle with that overlap. Uh, that I'm 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 still I've been working through trying to understand it. Um, better, and I'm not sure that I'm getting very far. Mm. It's kind of interesting um, hearing you speak and the kind of reflective nature of your responses. And yeah, it's kind of funny. People often um, jump onto podcasts, not necessarily as guests, but people who listen um, with the hope that they're going to hear someone giving them certainty and giving them clear directions and holding a space for uncertainty you know I personally kind of think is is really beneficial and you know in fact my day-to-day -day training I'm often saying you know actually I don't see my role as instructing and telling you how to do this thing it's you know keeping open the possibility that we're together finding our way so yeah just kind of wanted to know it's kind of interesting hearing your responses um you, you already kind of touched on um the kind of intersections and I don't know if that's a language that you use between um you know kind of you being black and being a man and yeah I kind of just wondered um yeah what your thoughts are about the unique challenges 
of being a black man? I think um, I, was, I was really drawn to the work of uh, Tommy Curry, uh, who's now at Edinburgh University, and um, wrote a book called The Man Not, which tried to uh, to place black men in a uh, well, suggest that black men were in a different kind of categorization. So they're they're victims of uh, they're victims of uh, the patriarchy in the same way that you know, uh, in a different way than women, but but still um, not benefit benefiting from it. So the, so gender, uh, he argues, shouldn't apply. Uh, uh, and in fact, uh, black men could be defined as as not men. Uh, the man not at the title of his book, um, and it's really attractive because it's really uh, it, it's it's really a um, a way of of saying not all men in a very uh, elaborate um, uh, theoretical structure. Um, and there's, there's, I think there's something, there's, there's some more, more exploration to, to do around, uh, around his concept. But um, for, for me, it, it's, it's, it's been challenging working on racial justice, uh, which, is a, which has been a field uh, for the last uh, 20 years, which has largely been uh, led by uh, led by, by women uh, running uh, voluntary sex organisations, um, it was it was challenging to talk about uh, black men in that space. Um, in part because uh, there was a, a, a pushback always to suggest that. Well, um, we're always talking about men, aren't we? Uh, and uh, you, you would often, uh, in fact, I, I commissioned a number of, uh, of studies and it's much easier to do uh, the studies of uh, black women's unemployment than it was to do a study of black men's unemployment. For example. Um, so uh, there's a, a way in which the history uh, bears really heavily um, on, 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 on the present, uh, and it's uh, again constrained and squeezed the space in which to talk about uh, uh, blackness and masculinity uh, at the same time. Just a quick point of clarification: when you said it was much easier to do studies on, you know, women, black women's unemployment, um, was that much easier in terms of attracting the funding, or just much easier in gathering the data? What what made it easier? So so much easier, much easier in terms of uh, of attracting the funding because there's a uh, because from funders there was this, this this sense and suggestion that actually that was refreshing to see uh, work on black women. Um, though I you know, I think if we were to do a, a kind of audit of, of racial justice work, perhaps apart from uh, uh, criminal justice. Um, we would see that actually the, the, the research has been quite balanced over the last uh, you know, 20, 25 years. Um, I, I think that uh, politically, the small p, it was, uh, it was always challenging to raise the question of men uh, in those spaces and say, well, um, you know, uh, Tommy, Tommy Curry's work uh, expressly starts with looking at men as victims of violence. Um, we don't really talk about men as victims uh, nearly enough to be black men as victims. Um, you know, so, so if you imagine uh, a conversation about knife crime, uh, it's often about men as aggressive and not men as victims in, in those spaces. It's, it's uh, uh, when you look at, uh, at the ways in which in which uh, police, in which which policing or uh, or in education, um, uh, to exclusion from school for my my uh, my doctoral study, um, and yes, there were uh, young women and girls excluded from school, but they were uh, a much smaller proportion of the of the whole. Um, 
yet uh, there was a uh, I, I ran into quite quickly a critique about uh, young women being ignored in that discourse. Uh, so uh, there's, a, there's a way in which the the uh, the, the, the emphasis on uh, and the, the space which white men take up uh, is uh, is transferred to suggest that black men take up a similar amount of space, uh, and I'm not sure that that's uh, that's empirically um, true. Mm, yeah, and I kind of found that quite persuasive, um, in so far as, in a way, you're examining, um, you know, kind of patriarchy um, as a system, which disadvantages many people, including black men, as if kind of stated quite explicitly, um, and you know, often when people kind of think about it, they think about individuals um, mm. reenacting patriarchy. Um, but if you look at it systemically for the reasons that come acts of violence against the black male body in the system in the criminal justice system and you know in other walks of life then you can kind of see that that power structure actually disadvantages black men so i can kind of see um the alliance um there and, and I, I think in part the other intersection i uh, the other part of the intersection in which I'm, i i i live and operate uh, is one of my uh, sexual identity. So, uh, as a gay man, uh, a lot of the conversations I have with other black gay men uh, will be about uh, the, the challenge of, uh, of of white gay men uh, and the way in which they they will objectify uh, that they will um, will reduce uh, black gay men to a to a sex organ uh, and not a, not a human, um, the kind of hyper masculine uh, men think or or just uh, ignore them. Um, and so it, it was quite challenging for me working on uh, issues of racism uh, to balance those ideas of, you know, or, or understand that the idea of the, the black men uh, were always. Uh, typified as aggressive uh, and and uh, and if they are always typified as aggressive how far away is that from the hypersexualized uh, violent uh, characteristics which um which are being uh, written on them by uh, by white gay men um so the, there is a the, there's a way in which there's a there, there are some traps there that, that you can fall into in that discussion um, and uh, and that's a, that's a real shame because actually um, this is, these are really the kind of things, uh, really the kind of space in which which more conversation would be very really fruitful. Um, as you said earlier, kind of that idea of holding space requires people to be able to hold uh, to 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 hold ways of understanding. Uh, their experience, um, rather than um, uh, sticking to a to a dogma. Um, um, also, there's a tendency um, in any kind of uh, theory that becomes highly political for it to become dogmatic. Mm. Mm. And in Emma De Beer's new book, um, published earlier this year when she kind of, on the subject of race, she um, subtitles it, um, well, moving from allyship to coalition. So the book's about like what white people can do next. Um, and that idea of like, you know, allyship's been really sold so much as kind of, you know, what white people need to do in the context of the Black Lives Matter um, movement and so forth. Um, but of course, coalition is something else, kind of recognizing that we're all invested in kind of similar goals. And I wondered where you saw opportunities for coalitions, kind of given some of the, I don't know if fragmentation is the right word, but you know, some of those things which are still not resolved. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, I, I, I think Emma's project there is, is, uh, is challenging and slightly problematic for me as well to, 
to write books centering what white people can do. Because uh, one of the things they can do is listen, right? And I, and I think that the, the, uh, um, the, 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 the project gave me a, told me all I needed to know about the publishing world uh, and, 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 uh, and the way in which we, uh, we need to sell books. So, so, I, so I get it, but I, um, I, I think coalitions is, is, is difficult unless people feel like they can be honest about uh, their experience and what they're, what they're seeing and, what they should, and, and, uh, and able to develop uh, uh, shared understandings uh, of, of the way in which uh, the world operates. And I um, established Blackout uh, about five years ago, uh, in part to encourage and enable a conversation. Um, and the opportunities uh, for, uh, for queer women and queer men, for example, to sit in the same space and, and, and talk about uh, our shared experiences and our shared, um, our shared aspirations have been minimal. Um, I've tried to create some. Uh, there aren't many that, uh, that I have access to that enable that conversation. And I, and I hope that, that that's not so true for younger people, but actually um, for those that I'm working with currently, uh, if I ask them how often they had sat and spoken with black lesbians, they would suggest it was, it was a very few times. Um, and that, so one, one of the things uh, uh, that, that white people could do uh, if we're following Emma's, uh, uh, Emma's um, lead um, would be to get out of the way, actually, so that those conversations uh, could happen. Um, it's, it's, it's very difficult to write, to, uh, to engage, to create spaces that are approaching safer. Um, across those gender lines, uh, I found. Um, so coalition requires conversation um, and there isn't enough of that kind of conversation. And I wondered, um, it's kind of funny when you talk about like white people getting out of the way or it's kind of, you know, freeing up and it made me think of Toni Morrison's kind of idea of the white judge and how actually in order to write, um, you have to just, like not take account of your white audience and self-censor and to just write as if they weren't there. Um, and, you know, Ibram X. Kendi has kind of, you know, continued um, in that vein, um, not necessarily to write in that vein, but certainly to speak in that vein. Um, yeah, I kind of wondered whether or not that's the kind of thinking you had in mind. Uh, completely. And, and so the, the, whole, the whole project of Blackout, um, which started as a, uh, as a website, um, it started as a, as a space for dialogue because I couldn't see a way in which I could write or speak to uh, other black women men uh, without uh, the editor of the Guardian having a say or the you know or or, 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 or one of the uh, people at Random House having a uh, having the ability to say well that surely that's not the issue. Um, and luckily, uh, is it luck, luck or, or judgment or, or, or the way in which the uh, social media has gone, there are more spaces in which people can have uh, conversation. Um, but for example, we, we host a, a mobile app. It's very clear that it's for uh, black queer men in the UK. Um, every week I throw three or four white men out of it. Because not because having our own space seems to be uh, anathema to them. Um, okay. Um, it's kind of really interesting, kind of hearing about these various intersections, and um, you know, I don't know, depending on which day, maybe or what time of the day, it kind of feels to me as though like I use the word fragmented um, as though we live in this society that is fragmented, that there's kind of, you know, so much um, happening in terms of, yeah, the splintering 
Um, and I kind of think about Brexit and the kind of Remainers. I'm, I'm, well. I'm not sure it's about splintering. I think it's about uh, coming ready to the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I, I've, been, I've been accused of, uh, uh, of being a separatist. Um, and, and actually, no, what, I, what, we're, what we're doing in creating a, a space uh, that is focused on, on, on black queer men and for them and by them um, is, is, is helping uh, a number of us to articulate what's going on with us. You know, how, do we, how, do we, how do we make sense of, 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 of the, com the complexity of the kind of warp and weft of, of living in kind of modern society, unless we can take some time to compare notes, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, in terms of race, you know, if you're the only, if there are only two black people in the village, do they just not like you, or is it racism? Uh, you can't tell until you had a conversation with the other black person, right? Uh, so that's the, that's the same thing that we're trying to do. <laughs> I, I really like that um, simple metaphor because, um, yeah, it's something that kind of comes up in my work on um, microaggressions and, you know, kind of, you know, Chester Pierce talks about the fact that you often won't hear or see anything that makes it explicitly about race, but you kind of, you know, the person experiencing it knows, in inverted commas. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's, it's not real or you can't be clearer until you go and talk to the other person and you're coming okay yeah there's a pattern here interesting and, and i suppose I, I i um one, one of the things blackout uh set out to do was, was to address the, the the leadership gap right where uh where black women had taken leadership over things you know, a crazy gk black pride for example or um, uh, if you uh, looked at the kind of founding of Stonewall, there were black women involved, but not back then. Um, it, it kind of, it, there's, some, there's something going on there about, uh, about uh, black queer men's ability to, to take the lead. Um, so in fact, the, the, the whole drive of Blackout was to to address that balance, so to, to introduce more people into that conversation about leadership across a, a larger group. So it's not, uh, you know, it's not separatist, it's actually uh, yeah. horribly integrationist. Okay. Yeah. And it, it, it's kind of interesting, kind of, you know, having this conversation with you. Um, and yeah, there are some things that for me are probably more obvious. For example, um, you know, as a DJ and kind of seeing a world. Um, where, you know, th there might be black women who identify as women who have relationships with women, um, whatever the nature, whether they identify as lesbians or not. Um, and I don't know of men in that genre who would say they have relationships with men um, or intimate relationships with men. And it's like, yeah, it's very clear that there's a very different um, kind of experience, not just within the groups, but the groups within wider society. Absolutely, um, and the uh, the way in which, uh, for administrative convenience, yeah, almost uh, we, we create LGBTQ uh, as if there's a uh, a natural uh, affinity. Um, we we make communities, we build communities, we are intentional about community. Um, and uh, asking people who have a uh, who often have a uh, negative set of experiences about communities that have, have rejected them or uh, or tried to uh, constrain them in in their youth, uh, expecting to jump straight into another uh, community, which uh, is people that they um, they haven't yet established what they have in common. Um, mm. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit, it's a bit of a tall order. So slow and steady, um, and and uh, and intentional. I think there's a there's a there's hope for building uh, new power bases, new ways of engaging with society from the LGBTQ uh, umbrella. 
but it has to be understood as an umbrella and, and work needs to be done in, in creating that community. Um, I, was, I was joking with a, with a friend over the weekend that um, on Crackle Common, uh, on Carnival weekend, there's a big African music festival. Um, and I was like, well, what is this? Is this a kind of power battle? This is the African Caribbean uh, kind of uh, tensions from the, from the 80s back again. Um, and and uh, if you don't do the work, you don't build a, a, a kind of shared identity. It doesn't just happen by accident. And your final word on how we do that? Um, so can we have those open conversations where I can uh, express, uh, express doubt, express, um, uh, express uh, concern about uh, what someone else holding a, a theory over experience uh, might, um, might mean for me. Um, without being shouted down, without being canceled, without being uh, told uh, somehow that I'm uh, traitor to a, a imagined group. Um, those aren't easy conversations to have. So, uh, so the habit of building uh, something together, uh, almost whatever it is, um, you know, if you, if you, if you, if you were to, to to have a common enemy that's 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 often quite a good way of building a, a sense of solidarity but you know building something positive art music uh are quite a good ways of bringing people together and so that's uh that's what we're uh currently engaging in with blackout uh we're, we're reopening pearl or cox bar that operated in the 70s in brixton um as a means of bringing people together to talk about what it means to have space uh what it could mean uh, to build something new together. Um, I'm hoping the margins there, people will understand. We'll, we'll get, we'll, we'll be able to develop conversations where they can actually ask people, each other, honest questions about how they really feel. So from digital to actual bricks yeah. and mortar. Yeah, um, and and it's really exciting to to do. Um, I, I think increasingly, I'm I'm, I'm convinced that uh, that without the bricks and mortar, uh, the digital doesn't really hold. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for uh, joining us, um, Rob. Thank you. Oh, it's been a pleasure. What an amazing conversation uh, with Rob. It's kind of really striking doing these, um, as I said in the piece, uh, you know, it's kind of holding a space where um, there is exploration without absolute certainty. And also, um, yeah, kind of thinking you've got identities imposed externally um, before there is any real, I don't know, he avoided the concept of coalition, but, you know, any sense of shared identity that work and, you know, Rob said, you know, the work needs to be done. So, yeah, I guess um, that could be translated to so many other contexts where either policymakers or a dominant narrative develops in society about you know people belonging to a group, um, and that's externally imposed. I'm um, kind of left a, a lot of kind of questions and thoughts for me over that. Um, so yeah, please keep tuning into the seasoning the reasoning podcast. Thanks so much. <laughs>